Good evening and uh, welcome. Uh, We are recording once again in an empty church because of the coronavirus lockdown around the world. And here in our state, we are filming and recording at the Three Angels Church, Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Newington, Connecticut in the United States of America. I want to invite in, we've been doing this um, weekly. We have quite a series. If you want to go to the Three Angels Church in Newington, Connecticut's website, um, you can see videos on our YouTube channel, as well as you can see video and audio on Audioverse of the meetings that we've been having here uh, under these circumstances. And so this is just more of that uh, coronavirus-related uh, content. Um, and we want to, again, welcome the KwaZulu Natal and Free State Conference uh, from Southern Africa. I was invited by my good friend, Rainier Horn. Uh, he and his wife are brothers and sisters in Christ with me, and I am just glad to be a part of uh, the ministry that you are all doing down there, um, all the way from the conference officials to every member. So God bless each one of you. We're going to get into God's word now, and um, our scripture reading tonight is taken from Revelation chapter 6. We're going to start at verse 11. Revelation chapter 6, starting at verse 11, and the Bible says, and white robes were, were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Our message tonight is entitled The Pandemic of Persecution. This is part one. The Pandemic of of Persecution, part one. Um, The Seven Seals of Revelation and Last Day Events the pandemic of persecution. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to study your word. Lord, again, I ask that you make me just a nail upon the wall, a rusty, sorry nail, Lord. But upon that nail, Lord, I ask that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ. Let Eric Walsh not be seen or heard. Instead, Father, let us hear a word from the throne room of grace. It's our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. We're not going to start in Revelation. We're actually going to start in the book of Acts. And we're going to jump to Acts chapter 7, starting at verse 54. Acts chapter 7, starting at verse 54. We jump in at the point where Stephen has just preached a powerful sermon to Jewish leadership as well as a Jewish layman. He recounted the history of Israel in scripture and walks them all the way to the time in which he is living just about uh, three and a half years uh, after the death of Christ. Um, And he is there and he is um, giving them this powerful sermon. And we will jump right in. I won't get into the sermon because we have a lot to to, to cover, but I want to show you what happens to see Stephen. In Acts 7 verse 54 says, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Stephen then says, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Verse 57 says, And they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. And cast him out of the city. And cast him out of the city. The Bible says that they stoned him and witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. The Bible tells us that when when Stephen is done preaching this powerful message, a message calling out the sins of the Jews, especially their leadership, when he does this, they're so enraged that they begin to, they, they grab him. The Bible says that they gnash at him and they throw him out of the city. The scripture says that they then take up stones and they begin to stone Stephen. In fact, 
It sets up the next stage of the book of Acts because the young man whose feet they throw uh, their clothes at his feet is, the, is a young man named Saul who later becomes Paul. And here Paul, the great apostle, is almost complicit in the murder and martyrdom of Steve, of Stephen. And here they are now. As he is dying, the scripture says he looks up and he can see Jesus seated at the right hand of God. He cries out, Lord, receive my spirit. He falls to his knees, the Bible says. He cries out, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And Stephen dies. Stephen is often called the first martyr of the Christian church. Um, and if nothing else, he's the first martyr in a sense that the church begins to shift, the gospel begins to shift after this. Before we get into the book of Revelation I do and Daniel, I do want to give you a little bit of what made the Jews so angry. In Acts 7 and verse 47, in the sermon he says, But Solomon built him a house, howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne, the earth and earth is my footstool. What house will ye build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Then he says in verse 50, Hath not my hand made all these things? Ye stiff-necked, look at how he speaks to them. Some folks say we, we ought to preach a timid, soft gospel, but I want you to see how Stephen preached this thing. He says, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one of whom you have been now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Stephen calls them out for their sin. He calls them out uh, for, 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 for their love of the temple. In fact, there are four issues that Stephen addresses with them that we have to address today. Let me, let me show you this. The first one is, as Stephen says, that Solomon built them a temple, but God was bigger than their temple. It, it gives you a flashback to Matthew chapter 24, when the disciples show Jesus the stones of the temple and say, look, Lord, look at the temple as if to impress Jesus because they had just uh, cleansed the temple and had just berided the Jewish leadership. They were trying to remind him, look, Lord, look at this great temple. And Jesus says, I, I say unto you, I, I leave the, your house unto you desolate. And he says that not one stone would be left upon another. And just as Jesus did not give any big uh, kudos to the temple, neither does Stephen. And it was in their almost worship of the temple that the Jews got caught up. And isn't it interesting that it would not be long after the death of Stephen, 30-something years before the temple itself, the prophecy of Matthew 24 would be fulfilled and the temple would be destroyed. Here's what's crazy. I don't have time to get into it tonight, but what's crazy is that today the same lies are being told. The lie that the temple is going to be rebuilt in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount where there's now a mosque. And some say, well, a mosque isn't in the same place, but it's close. And on that mount, they're, they're saying what was once Mount Moriah, uh, where Abraham, uh, where many argue Abraham would have taken Isaac to be sacrificed. They want to build a temple. And here's what's crazy. Even American political policy is built on the idea that that temple must be rebuilt in Jerusalem. And if you go back to the French um, and Napoleon, who first said that, that, that the Jews should have uh, Israel back as their homeland, European Jews who, who had, if they were ever in, your, in, in Israel, had not been from many, many centuries. And then, of course, the Balfour Declaration of the, by the British, which gave Palestine over to the Jews. And all of that happened. And now even America, there's a, there's a focus on Israel as the center of prophecy in many of our evangelical churches. And I've heard Great preachers, uh, evangelical preachers like Tony Evans out of Dallas, Texas say that Jesus is going to come back and rule out of that temple and he's going to force the world to keep his commandments for 1,000 years. 
Yet that is not biblical. God never forces anyone to do anything. And yet today, American policy is built in many ways around the idea that Jesus cannot return unless there's a temple built on a, that mount in Israel. So Stephen had an issue with that temple. Just like in last days, that's going to be a problem. Many are going to be lost, just like the Jews were lost, because they're focused on a Messiah coming to a temple that no longer has relevance. They're waiting for a Messiah to come to a temple that no longer has relevance. And here is how Satan will be able to deceive by coming as an angel of light. The second issue that Stephen had to deal with, that he dealt with with them, is God is creator. We're dealing with that today as evolution has taken over and so many doubt that there is a God. I, I won't get into that except to say it's an interesting issue that we also have today. But of course, Stephen was being persecuted and persecution of the believers will happen again in the last time. That is what this message is going to focus on. But the last one is interesting. It says they were not keeping the law of God. In fact, the protection of Israel, eventually they wore out their welcome under the protective banner of God because they continued to not keep God's law. Stephen says that they brutalized the prophets and even the just one, Jesus Christ, when he came, they were conspirators against him and they murdered the Lord Jesus. He said, you don't keep the law of God. And they got so angry. And this is why the Bible says they, they gnashed at him. They gnawed at him. They took him and grabbed Stephen, threw him into the streets, and they stoned him, murdered him in cold blood. Even as he asked God to not lay the sin they were committing against them. But prophetically, there's two things that, that are relevant. First one is, what happened to Stephen will happen again. And we're going to find that there are iterations of, of persecution in the scripture. If this is part one, you make sure you tune in for part two. If, if you are in uh, uh, KwaZulu, Natal, and Free State Conference, I want to encourage you to come to the church's website or go to Audioverse when we publish this next week, the second half of it, because I can't get through all of it in one, in one sitting. But I want you to see that, that iter it will repeat these iterations of persecution. That's why this message is entitled The Pandemic of persecution. And we have seen that um, things have gotten very crazy in the world because of this, this pandemic, because of the coronavirus. We have watched pastors be arrested. We've watched churches be sued in South Korea. We are seeing uh, that churches have actually had to sue the U.S. government or fight against the U.S. government, I should say, or their local governments. And the United States Justice Department has gone in to allow them to have drive up church service in their own cars because the local governments wouldn't allow them. It's embedded in this time of lockdown is an interesting truth. And that is that on one hand, it is a test. Precedents might be being set as to how you could shut down, not just the society, but specifically how you could shut down the church. So when Stephen died, it was critical to the stream of prophecy. And in this chart, and we're going to show some charts tonight. So in this chart, you can see here that there's a, this begins the 1810 years. I'll show you that in a second. But when after Stephen is stoned, Israel would no longer be the center of prophecy, not the Israel of the scripture. What, we would, what would happen instead is that pagan Rome would take out ancient Israel and that papal Rome would try to take out spiritual Israel. In fact, in that moment, the, the shift went, follow me now, when Stephen is stoned as Saul, who would later become Paul, is watching, he doesn't notice. This is how God is so good to us, church. Saul doesn't realize as he's watching that he is witnessing a historical prophetic shift in the way that God would work on the earth. And Saul, as he's almost applauding what they're doing to Stephen, does not realize he's next. Y'all missing this thing. Saul is next. And even as he is still in sin, this, you know, that's why the Bible says, uh, um, uh, that God loved us so much that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God was working to use Saul when Saul was still working against God. And in AD 34, when Stephen is stoned, uh, as you look at the 490-year prophecy, the 70 weeks of Daniel, when you look at it, it ends this prophecy. 
prophetic period. And here's what I want you to get, church. When it happens, the gospel shifts. No longer is it to go into the Jewish nation. Now it must go out to the entire world. And isn't it ironic that the guy holding everybody's coat would be, the, would be God's major mouthpiece? Let me tell you something. If you're living a life that you think God can't, redeem you from, if you don't think you can be restored, I challenge you to look at the life of Paul. Paul was complicit in murder in this story, and yet he becomes the greatest of, a, of evangelists the world may have ever known. So let's look at this a little bit. Let's get into this a little bit. We don't have a whole lot of time, and there's a lot of prophecy to go through tonight, but let's go through this because I want to make this prophecy relevant for today. So let's look at this. We know, and I, again, I don't have the time to go through the verses and all of the history, so we'll never get through this because it would take me a week's worth of Revelation and Daniel seminars to do it, but some of you should know this, so we'll just go through this quickly, and your local churches can fill you in on, the, on how we get to some of this. In 450 C, there was a decree put out to rebuild Jerusalem. The prophet tells us in the book of Daniel that 70 weeks would pass, that Messiah would be cut off in the middle of that week. And that is the time that we knew, and that the Messiah would be, would be anointed at the 69th week, or 483 years. Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in AD 27. When he was baptized, that was the anointing of the Messiah. His earthly ministry began, and that is when the gospels really begin. Read the book of Mark. You'll notice that the story begins at AD 27, pretty much, at the time when Christ is anointed, clearly fulfilling this prophecy. Let me, let me break this down even further. How do you think the Magi, the wise men, knew to go to, to Bethlehem to look for Christ? They had studied the Old Testament prophecies. They knew that the time was almost up. They knew he had to be anointed and that he would be anointed probably as an adult. So they came Decades earlier, when they saw the signs in the stars, and they saw it, and they came knowing the time of the Messiah was here. How did they know? Because the prophecies are sure. Of course, three and a half years later, Christ is crucified right on time. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And when he does that, that was the end of the temple service there in Jerusalem. So while the Jews are almost worshiping their temple, they don't realize that the purpose of the, 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 the temple has been fulfilled. Type has meant anti-type, and the temple has no more purpose. This is why once got that happened and the veil is torn, the Spirit of God left the place. Uh, and in fact, um, when, when the temple is finally torn down by Titus and his soldiers, the, the, they cry out, Ichabod, Ichabod, the glory has departed. They didn't realize. The glory departed when they crucified the Lamb of God. Three and a half years later, Stephen is stoned. That ends the 490 years. But the 490 years are embedded in a longer prophecy. If you look here, the 490 years are embedded in a 2300-day prophecy. We'll go through this a little bit tonight. We don't have all the time in the world for this. But I want you to see that here's your 483 years that gets to Christ's baptism. Here's the crucifixion. Here's the stoning of Stephen here in 34 AD. And there's some explanations on this slide. That I, I can't get into all of this, but you can look up some of these verses. And of course, I, what, what my favorite part of it is how well it predicts Christ's crucifixion because it was at the cross that Jesus won the victory for us. And here's why that's relevant. The demons and Satan were cast out for good at the cross. Roger Minot in his book, A Trip into the Supernatural, tells us that when the demons came for him, this former demon worshiper, when they came to try and get him back after he'd become a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, Roger Murnau says that he would read out loud the 27th chapter of the book of Matthew and the demons can't stand to hear the story of the crucifixion of Christ. Because at the cross, they lost it all. But for us, we sing to him at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. This is where it happens. The burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by grace I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. If you're a Christian, you ought to be happy all the day because of what Christ did on the cross. And it was prophesied. It happened right when it was supposed to happen. 
But what I want to focus on, I'm, I'm shifting. I'm, I'm going to get through some stuff. What I want to focus on is what happens between 34 AD and 1844. We as Adventists uniquely look at 1844. We know that many call it a great disappointment. What it really was was a great purging. And we'll talk more about this next week, but it was a great purging where the church went from where there were Miller had Miller had thousands and thousands of Millerite followers on multiple continents. And when the great disappointment was over, there were just a handful of believers less, probably less than 20, some say. So that when God started the remnant church, it started with a pure, small group to build the church. But in 1844, the judgment begin, began in heaven. And we'll, talk, we'll come back around to that. But this is the 2300-day prophecy. So what we know when you go inside of this, here's the 2300-day prophecy again. At 34 AD, the gospel begins to be preached to the Gentiles. And there's a 1,260-year period inside this 1,810 years that I want to focus on. Remember, there are iterations of persecution. Stephen is kind of a type to what would happen during some of these iterations. And it's almost interesting that his words reflect back to Christ's words in Matthew 24, where there's tribulation of the dark ages as well as the tribulation of the last days are both prophesied. And I'll get into some of the details of what's on here, but you can see it fits in there quite nicely. So we have to jump to the book of Daniel now. Daniel chapter 11, starting at verse 36, begins to describe this 1,260-year time period. Daniel 11 and verse 36 says, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that, uh, for that, is, that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire for women, nor regard any God. He shall magnify himself above all. And this is speaking of what we will soon see is what is called the little horn power. And this power would exalt itself, would not look, would not have the desire of women, which is, is summed up in the, in the doctrine of celibacy for the leadership of this organization. Um, and would not regard the God of his fathers, but it will magnify himself above all. In Daniel uh, chapter 7, verse 19, this is the amplified version of the Bible, it says, Then I wished, Daniel said, to know the truth about the fourth beast. I don't wish I had time to go through all the beasts, but again, we're, going, we're trying to get somewhere. Then I wish to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly terrible and shocking, whose teeth were of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, broke, and crushed, and trampled what was left with its feet. The Bible describes the mighty uh, pagan Roman empire here, um, but it, it goes into a little more detail. Verse 20 of Daniel 7, it says, and about the 10 horns representing kings, remember this is the amplified version, so you get these bracketed explanations in it, that were on its head, and the other horn, which came up later, and before which three of the horns fell. The horn which had eyes and a mouth, and a mouth listen to this, that spoke great things and which looked greater than the others. But here's what I want to get to. Daniel 7 and verse 21 says, As I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. This horn made war with the saints. And I have a picture there from um, the, uh, depicting the Dark Ages in Europe. And you can see that they used to practice and, and perfect multiple systems of torture and abuse. Their goal was to get people to recant their beliefs. I, I want you to get this. Death was their last resort to silence the Christian. They, like Nebuchadnezzar, wanted everyone to bow before the image of false religion that they had set up. But when you wouldn't bow, they'd put you to death. The Bible says, verse 21, as I looked, this horn made war with the saints and prevailed over them. 
probably one of the most difficult periods in church history. You can imagine the innocent women and children they killed. <clears throat> Men who would not revoke their belief in Jesus Christ or in his word or in his truth or in his law were put to death in the most terrible ways. I have a sermon where I talk about how in the United States there's a book, uh, The Catholic Church and Slavery, and they talk about how the, the systems that were used to, 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 to torture the Protestants and the, and the true Christians in Europe during the Dark Ages were actually used against the slaves in North America and in the Caribbean, uh, in the West in general. But Daniel 7.25 says this, And he shall speak, speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and he shall be given, and, it shall, and they shall be given into his hand until a time of times and a dividing of times. A time is a year, 360 days. When you do the math, it's 1,260 days. And the year, the day year principle, which I can't get into tonight, tells us that this is the same 1,260 years. And what it is telling you is the law of God, they would try and change it. And if you don't believe me, just get a Catholic catechism and notice that the first commandment or the commandment that says that you should not make any graven images is removed. And because of that, the fourth commandment becomes the third. But the fourth commandment is shortened to simply say, remember the Sabbath day. It does not give you the rest of the verse. And the 10th commandment, not to covet, is split into two parts so that you still have 10 commandments in, in the uh, Catholic catechism. They sought to change times and laws. The Bible gives us more on this. Revelation 12, 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her a thousand two hundred and three score days. In Revelation chapter 12, the church gives birth. Uh, the woman gives birth to the child. The, the government tries to get at it, as, as Isaiah says, and you kind of is depicted in, Roman, in Revelation chapter 12. And she has to be taken into the wilderness. The wilderness is that time of trouble. And you can see it's again 1,260 days or 1,260 years. The church had to hide. We'll talk about that more in a second. In Revelation chapter 13 and verse 5, and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months, which again is 1,260 days or 1,260 years. And you can see power was given to him. How did this all start? Before we get to our main theme for the night. Well, historically, so that we can anchor this down, because the prophecies anchor us in. Let me tell you something. The reason prophecy is important because it allows you to understand the surety of God's word, how sure it is. And on that basis alone, the Bible becomes more open to you because you are your faith is exercised and strengthened. Prophecy does that. In 538 AD, the Ostrogoths abandoned their siege of Rome. And this left the Bishop of Rome to exercise the prerogatives of Justinian's decree of 533 AD. The power and authority of the papacy grew and grew and grew. 538 AD. So what was Justinian's code that kicks off the Dark Ages? The 1,260 years. What brings this little horn up to power? And Justinian's Code of 533 AD says, The Code of Our Lord, the most sacred emperor Justinian, concerning the most exalted trinity and the Catholic faith, and providing that no one shall dare to publicly oppose them. And there's a picture of Justinian there. And it says, and we, this is a part of his code, we order all those who follow this law to assume the name of Catholic Christians. And considering others as, listen to what they consider if you don't accept Catholicism in 533 AD, considering others as demented and insane, we order that they shall bear the infamy of heresy. And when the divine vengeance which they merit has been appeased, they shall afterwards be punished in accordance with our, with our resentment, which we have acquired from the judgment of heaven. They said, if you don't, Follow what the Catholic Church teaches. And remember, we're going to go through the four horses. We're going to get all over the place here, but don't worry, I'm going somewhere. And what they what they wanted to do was to make it so everyone followed every what the, what, what was what, what the what the Bishop of Rome said. They said, if you don't follow that, 
It is because you're demented and insane. John, Bishop of the city of Rome, to the most illustrious and merciful son, Justinian, the Roman emperor, among the conspicuous reasons for praising your wisdom and gentleness, most Christian of emperors, you have preserved reverence for the see of Rome. To this day, the Vatican is still called the Holy See, and have subjected all things to its authority and given it unity. In 538 AD, Justinian took the church and made the church powerful Oh, and made and passed civil law that the church, uh, that, the, that the, everyone had to bow to the will of the church. Let me tell you something. In the middle of our pandemic, this is where we're headed again. We are headed back to a time like Justinian's code, where for good cause and the common good of the environment, as we've talked about in earlier uh, portions of this series, for the environment or to benefit the poor or to help the animals, or a million reasons, we are going to move in unity to solve the world's problems. Vigilius, in 538, ascended the papal chair under the military protection of Belisarius, and that is in the history of the Christian church, volume three, page 327. And here now, the secular government propped up the church, Constantine, began to move, as you'll see when you go through the, the, the churches. And we can't get deep into that tonight either, but, but you can see what happens. And you get to a place where the state government is literally supporting the church. And let me tell you something, we are not as far from this today as it might seem. In fact, when I visited the capital of the European Union, I was shocked when I went in the building and saw Catholic um, statues and, and, and symbolism all over the place. And I thought to myself, this is in America, this would never happen. We would never mix these religious symbols in. And then I thought about when you go to Washington, D.C., in fact, much of the symbolism of our capital city is of the occult and Masonics. So you'll see there's a blending of certain things that are happening even in the symbols that we put up. So the 1260 years, one more time. It's mentioned seven times, Daniel, Revelation, all the different times, they're all listed here, um, that is mentioned in the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Here's with the date, the years that it covers from AD 538. It ends in 1798. Um, in the Bible, it is called the wilderness in Revelation 12, 6, the great tribulation in Matthew 24 and verse 21. It is the dark ages of history when the brilliant scientist Galileo came up with theories that uh, the, the church did not want. I mean, theories as simple as the earth is not flat. Even though it's, you know, it's crazy that there are people who are now preaching again or teaching again. Go on the internet. There are people who are called flat earth people and they believe the earth is flat again. Yes, that's, that's crazy. But Galileo was taken before them because his theories went against church teaching. So he could not, you couldn't learn freely because the church would restrict it. These created the dark ages. We'll talk more about that in a second. I'm going to talk about how it ends. I normally would push this to the end of this, but I want to talk about how it ends. And then I want to talk about it's the relevance of what happened during that period to what's going to happen today and set us up for the conclusion in the next, uh, next message. The end of the 1260 years, in 1798, the French general Berthier proclaimed the political rule of the papacy had come to an end. He took the Pope prisoner to France where he died in exile and the 1260 year rule of the papacy was finished. Then the prophecy could be understood. So what's interesting about this is, um, this is the wound, if you, if you study the prophecies of Daniel Revelation, this is where the, the, the beast was wounded. This was a, a mortal wound because all of a sudden the secular power, Napoleon was the mightiest of, uh, of conquerors at the time and Napoleon's general takes the Pope brings him to France, and he dies in exile. The church does not recover from that for a very long time. And what's interesting is France begins to move towards more of a society of reason, a, away from a Catholic nation. Many Christians have been persecuted and put to death in France and in Spain even during the time of the Spanish Inquisition. And so all of these things had come to bear, and the French now moved. In fact, uh, it wasn't until like 1833 that actually the Spanish Inquisition, the law is passed to end it officially. But the Catholic Church loses its power in 1798. 
And so uh, let me, I'll read this. The spectacular victories of the armies of Napoleon in Italy placed the Pope at the mercy of the French revolutionary government, which now advised that the Roman religion would always be a persistent enemy of the Republic. The government urged Napoleon to destroy the center of unity of the Roman church, and Napoleon did just that. And in 1798, the 1260 years ends just as the scripture prophesies. History bears witness to the word of God. So the deadly wound was the end of the union of church and state, and the establishment of republics as a principal way world powers would be governed. But something else happens here. This transitions us to the end of time. We now know that the last days begin then. Daniel 12 and verse 4 says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. The book of Daniel had been sealed up until that time. And in a, a, a period of biblical and scriptural enlightenment had begun with the Protestant Reformation and had now come to a crescendo. And after 1798, there would be many who would begin to know the truths of the scripture. And so we want to look at the history from another angle now. And here we begin to look at the four horsemen of Revelation chapter 6. I will deal with them as seals so that we can keep consistent between the two messages. And so when we go to uh, Revelation 6 and verse 1, the Bible says, And I saw John the Revelator speaking, and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And this generally is regarded as the church from 31 uh, AD to 100 AD. There were warnings of apostasy and the true church was victorious. During this period, the time when, uh, in fact, nobody was there to really oppose the church like they normally would have because the Jews were in full-blown re uh, rebellion against the Roman Empire. And because of this, Jerusalem, they were allowed to preach the gospel for a few decades after Christ's death because the, the focus wasn't on the Christians. Christ had died and the apostles were preaching, but the focus, and even though the book of Acts shows you that the, Roman, the, the Jewish powers still didn't like them, but the gospel was able to be preached up until the time of the fall of Jerusalem in AD 40. When, when Jerusalem falls, the Christians have to leave and the gospel by default gets scattered all over the world. And as Rome is dealing with uprisings, the Christians aren't initially seen as a threat to the worship of the emperor. And so for that first few years, powered by the Holy Spirit, powered by unity, um, the, the bows, the arrows of the gospel are able to go forth and prick the hearts of people and convert them to Christianity. That white horse, interestingly enough, uh, the, 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 the first church uh, has a rider sitting on a white horse. And it's interesting that later in Revelation, Christ is depicted riding on a white horse uh, as he comes to get us. The crown on his head is a Stephanos. It's not the crown of a king. This is the crown of a victor. This is the crown you put on someone who wins. And that is the way that the church began, conquering and to conquer. But the second seal is open. In Revelation 6 and verse 3, it says, And when he had opened the second seal... I heard the second beast say, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and, they should, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. What happens? Well, in the next phase between 100 and uh, into the three, into the, um, the, the 300s, the early 300s, I mean, there's some, you know, I don't really weigh too much on the exact years these things transition because there would be trends. But in that next couple hundred years, the church is now persecuted ferociously. What's interesting, however, is that some of the early church fathers, one of them is quoted as saying, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. It waters the ground and the church grew. And as they would, they would do again, like I said, different iterations of persecution. Stephen was persecuted by the Jewish leaders, but under pagan Rome, the persecutions were terrible. They would take Christians into, the, into places like the Colosseum and release upon them wild beasts. They would, they would they'd have gladiators do things to them. And it, it, horrible things as spectators applauded. 
But here's what happened. As they were being persecuted for their beliefs, as the sword, this great sword of Revelation 6 and verse 4 uh, 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 is, is talked about here, as this great sword would, would come upon them, and people in the audience of these coliseums would watch or they'd hear the next day around the water cooler at work, they would wonder, why would anyone suffer this way for a lie? And as more and more Christians died, more and more people around them in Rome and in far-reaching aspects of the Roman Empire, people began to think and say, what they're saying must have some validity. For who would be tortured and die like that for a lie? And so the church began to grow and grow and grow. And I could, I could talk more about this, but this is not really the point. The church grew under persecution. Uh, people began to see the truth to the point where even Constantine, the, the future emperor, his own mother becomes a Christian. And here's where it gets sticky. Because in Revelation 6 and verse 5, it says, And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And there's a lot of ways people try to interpret this. The point I, I want to make tonight, because we could go into this so much deeper, we could do a whole message on just these four horses. But I want to make the point that what happens in this, as this seal is broken, and uh, the third seal is broken and the black horse comes out, is that now the church gets hijacked. We're just reading about Justinian. He doesn't come on the scene for a couple hundred years. But when Constantine decides, I want to unify my empire, I am going to take paganism and I'm going to take paganism and I'm going to baptize it and bring it into the church. That's why we have Easter, Ishtar. That's why we have Christmas on December 25th, celebrating of the birth of an actual pagan God. That's why Sunday is the day kept by most Christians in the world. It is because paganism was taken, baptized and brought into the church. And that's why the church goes from white to red when the church, when, when the, when the church has been attacked by this foreign power to black, because black is the opposite of white. And what the Bible is really trying to tell you is that, uh, uh, that there becomes a famine for the word of God. And that's caught right here where it says, and I, and I heard a voice in the midst of the force beast say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. Um, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And what it basically saying is, for what was once one day's labor, where you would be able to buy what you needed to, to feed your family, under a famine, the price goes through the roof. And I wish I had time, because in the Old Testament, the prophet says that there is a famine for the word of God. And all of a sudden, the church gets gutted. The truth gets ripped out. Apostasy slips in. But God still has a people during this time who do not bow their knee to what is going on. And this famine for the word of God becomes crazier and crazier as instead of Christ riding a white horse in the beginning, we go to the next church, or to the next um, horse, the fourth seal. And it says, and I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, come and see. And I beheld and I looked and beheld a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, which I believe represents Satan himself. So at first, Christ is the head of the church, but this church, whoever this horse is, and horses, remember, are, are, are in the Bible represent a, a, a means of battle or war. Whoever's riding this thing now, the, the spiritual war that's going on, it is now the devil in control of what's called the church now. And his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed him with him. And power was, and, that's because, and hell follows him because the second death is what this, what this, what this, um, what this, this pale horse rider is really doling out. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. Ah, so here's where we were trying to get to. The pandemic of persecution. After the church is gutted of truth under the third seal, and the horse turns black, and there's a famine for the word of God, the spirit of the enemy takes over. And as we discussed in 538, 
Justinian then launches the Vatican, or what I should say, the, 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 the Roman see, the, 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 the head of the church to the top, as we just discussed. Once that happens and, it is, and, it is, and, and, he's, and he's elevated to this high position, now what happens is you say, I've got to stop everyone who doesn't believe as I believe. Anyone who doesn't bow to me. And ironically, the very way that pagan Rome sought to take out the, uh, the, 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 the Jews and, 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 and real uh, flesh and blood Israel, now the papal uh, power here wants to take out spiritual Israel. The Bible says there are four ways that it tried to do this. One, it says those powers given him over the fourth part of the earth. Some say the well, fourth part of the Roman Empire was destroyed in this process. But I would argue that, in fact, the earth itself began to be impacted. Because not long after this time, um, colonialism and imperialism begins. And the very nations that the church controls in Europe, like the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Dutch, the French, they begin to scatter around the world and take colonies. And so Catholicism begins to spread all over the world during this period. And they use something to control. They kill with the sword, which is war, and with hunger, famine, and with death, or the beasts of the earth. So isn't that interesting? They kill with death? How do you kill with death? Well, it speaks to the fact that, again, this is the second death we're, being, we're speaking about. But the Greek word for death there, I want to focus on that, is the word thanatos. And this is the word that Marvel Comics and Marvel Universe takes the word, it makes the character Thanos from. In fact, the very, <laughs> I wish I had time, but the premise of all of that really is uh, that Thanos, um, which goes back to the Greek god of death, and the word Thanatos, that, that that character in the Marvel Universe represents what was happening here. And I'll leave it at that for those of you who know how that story goes. But here the Bible says death. Now some translate that as pestilence. So like Matthew 24, it's war, famine, pestilence. Interesting. Same kind of order. But during this time, and I want to submit to you that we are living in that time. So while we are afraid in this uh, coronavirus time, of, of, of death from the pestilence, I want to submit to you that what the devil is after is to kill you not with simple pestilence, but to kill you with death itself, with thanatos, meaning that you spiritually die. While the world is worried about the economy and how we keep everything up, the enemy is trying to figure out how do I make a famine for the word of God? How do I figure out a way to get the entire world to be killed with death itself because they die spiritually? Let me tell you something. I have recently, um, another person close to me, a friend of mine in California, I got a call this week at about 1.30 in the morning, committed suicide again. Not the first person in my last few years of my life that has committed suicide. And I realized that, that almost that's what's inherent in here is that you, the world will get to a place. The Bible says men's hearts would fail them for fear, Jesus says in Luke chapter 21. And I want to submit to you that as the, the powers of heaven are shaken, as the world begins to go crazy, there are folk who do not know God and the devil will pounce on them. And he will kill them with death. In other words, he's trying to take you out in such a way that you have no hope for salvation. That's what he was trying to do to the true church. It was hiding in the wilderness. This time goes back to the woman being in the wilderness. It's the same time period. It goes back uh, to the little horn coming up and trying to destroy the saints of God. This is the same time period. It says, and with the beasts of the earth, I might talk more about this next on the next message, but here there's two places in the Bible where it talks about uh, people being uh, brute beasts because they're so uh, spiritually destroyed. And I want to submit to you that as we saw in Canada this week, where there was a mass shooting and 16 people were killed in Canada, where where stuff like that just doesn't happen. I want to submit to you while we 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 are focused on a virus. I think we ought not forget that there are still brute beasts among us. We still live in a violent world. 
In fact, the famine, you know, we talk about hunger here. One of the big news stories this week in the United States is that we are facing now a, a pandemic of, of famine and hunger. There's some predicting that thousands, maybe millions could die. They just told us that the, the western part of the United States is about to hit a drought like has not occurred in 1,200 years, some are reporting. I want to submit to you that if, you, we, if we were to go back, as we did earlier in the series, and look at Matthew 24, those things are, those, those signs, those warning signs are coming up. And let me submit to you that, like I said, it's, a, it's iterations. Persecution happened under this, under the fourth seal, under the pale horse. It's coming again. And I'm going to show you in a second from the Bible that it is guaranteed to happen again. Because when the papacy was in full power, she was terrible. In fact, Dr. James Wiley, I don't know why he quotes this in the Great Controversy, but Dr. James Wiley said this. He said, the noon of the papacy was the midnight of the world. Colonialism took this all over the world, and Mel Gibson, um, in one of his movies, um, uh, uh, Apocalypta, he, in that movie, Apocalypto, in that movie, he actually shows as the movie ends as the Spanish um, ships from Spain pull up to, to Central America and how they go in and conquer, you know, it doesn't tell you that part of the story, but, but basically that was the apocalypse. That was the end of the world for all those pagan tribes. And it happened all over the globe. And the whole world was brought under the control of the superstition of Rome. And again, millions died in this process. Ellen White says this in a great controversy, page 54. She says, in the 6th century, the papacy had become firmly established. Its seat of power was fixed in the imperial city, and the bishop of Rome was declared to be the head over the entire church. Paganism had given place to the papacy. The dragon had given the beast his power and his seat and great authority. Revelation 13, 2, and now began the 1260 years of papal oppression foretold in the prophecies of Daniel and the Revelation, Daniel 7, 25, Revelation 13, 5 through 7. Ellen White goes on and she says, Christians were forced to choose either to yield their integrity and accept the papal ceremonies and worship or to wear away their lives in dungeons or suffer death by the rack, the faggot, or the headsman's axe. Now were fulfilled the words of Jesus. You shall be betrayed, both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends. And some of you shall they cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. One thing that the church did an incredible job of during the dark ages that Ellen White is trying to give you here. And again, this is going to happen again. It, will, it is an iteration that will repeat. Is that they, they painted these people in such a horrible light. They were viewed as the worst people uh, possible. They were viewed as the enemies of the state, enemies of the church, enemies of humankind. And so everyone hated them. They turned on them with social shame. And let me tell you what's crazy. The ability to shame someone socially during the dark ages pales in comparison to shame someone socially in a time of social media. Let me tell you something, church. It will not take anything for false videos of us to be made. Lies to be told about us. Put out in the media and in social media. And it will circle the globe. I myself has experienced this. I know what this is like. I know what it was like when people will come against you and begin to tell lies about you. And to paint you as an evil person. And, and, and turn whole communities against you. I've experienced it. And I'm telling you, it's going to happen to more of us. And let me tell you something. If your paycheck or your house or your friends or your family is more important than being a Christian and being faithful to the word of God, when the pressure comes, when you're ostracized like those who were working with Noah and helping him build the ark, when they could no longer take being ostracized, they dropped their hammers and went back to where they went and died. Because they would rather not be teased than to please God. Ellen White goes on and she says, Great Controversy, page, five, page 54. Persecution opened upon the faithful 
with greater fury than ever before, and the world became a vast battlefield. For hundreds of years, the Church of Christ found refuge in seclusion and obscurity. Thus says the prophet, the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that she should feed her there, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. During the Dark Ages, the church had to hide. In fact, to make this kind of come together, if you jump back to Revelation 6 and verse 9, and around the time when the, when the, when the Protestant Reformation happens, and some people argue that the, the, the last seal would last all the way to 1798. Again, don't, don't stick with the dates. I will say that I believe that the Protestant Reformation is the beginning of the cry to, to, to justify the martyrs not just before men, but before the universe. And verse nine says, and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So we've seen in the other seals how we've been pro how the church had been persecuted. And in the last seal, it gets the worst. They kill even with death. But now the Bible says, under the altar, where the altar represents earth, outside of the heavenly temple, the altar, just like the altar of, of, of sacrifice would have been outside of the, of the holy, of the most holy place. The altar represents the earth. And I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimonies which they held. Now watch this. Verse 10 says, and they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Their blood begins to cry out to God. Now, this is not the, the separated spirits. This is not Scooby-Doo. There, there's no ghost floating around in this story. But just like when Abel was killed by Cain, the Bible tells us that his blood cried out to God. In other words, God sees the injustices that happen. And he understands as these martyrs were dying, many of them were wondering, God, save me. Where are you? But they still sang the hymns of God. And like Stephen, many of them still pardoned or asked God to pardon those who were torturing them. God knew that some of them wondered where he was. And here he's, it, the, 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 the revelator John says, they cried with a loud voice, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Look at verse 11, I underlined it. And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Wait a minute. So when the martyrs from the dark ages, when, they're, when, they, when their blood cries out to God, God says, stay there. Now, this is how you know they're not floating around in heaven or floating around on earth. He says, you need to rest. What is the rest? The rest of death is the sleep of death, the first death, not the second death, because they would be resurrected again. When would they be? The Bible tells us clearly, for in a little season, after a little while, you will be raised, and who will you join? You will join those that will be killed afterward like you were. Church, there is coming a pandemic of persecution. If what is going on in the world now scares you, I want you to understand that something worse is coming for those who truly believe in God. And in verse, in Revelation 6 and verse 12, it says this, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth um, of hair and the moon became as blood and the stars of heaven fell onto the earth even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. We'll get into this more next next message, but this earthquake is the Lisbon earthquake and it shook all of Europe and into Africa even and much of the world felt this earthquake. It's probably one of the biggest earthquakes uh, literally the world has ever known. And it was a sign, like a, it was like saying that the, 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 the papal power would soon be broken. And this is when the sixth seal comes in. And I want you to understand that we are living between Revelation 6 and verse 13 and Revelation 6 and verse 14. Because Revelation 6 and verse 14 says it like this, and the heaven departed as a scroll 
when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. We talked about this in Matthew chapter 24 when Jesus um, warned the women that were following him that, that, event, that, that the time would come when Jerusalem was falling that they would want to run to the rocks and, and hide themselves. He, he said, and again, at the end of time, Revelation 6 tells us that as Jesus is returning, some will run and try and hide themselves. Verse 16, and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us. And hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Hide us. In fact, there will be a special resurrection, we are told, where those who crucified Jesus are going to come up as he is coming back to earth and they're going to see that the one they crucified, in fact, was the king of the Jews. He was everything he said he was. They're going to look upon his face in shame and rejection. Hide us from the face of the Lamb. We'll finish on first, verse 17 this week, and uh, we'll, we'll pick this up next week. Revelation 6, 17 says, For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? I want to close tonight by asking that question. If Jesus came tonight, would you be able to stand? Would you be able to look into the face of Jesus and, and be a joyful and, and it be a celebratory moment where you could say, uh, this is our Lord. Behold, we have waited for him. He is our God. Would you be able to say that? Or would you be like the people depicted in Revelation 6, 15 and, and 16, running to the rocks to say, fall on us. Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. I finished this week, and we'll, we'll pick this up next week and get a little deeper into this uh, because we're going to talk a little bit more about how persecution is going to come to us in, in these last days. But I want to leave you with this. You need to be prepared now to stand then. The great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? I pray that with all the power of the prophecies we just studied, that you understand that God's word is true and exact. And just as it says that on uh, 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 27 AD, Jesus would be baptized. And that uh, seven years later, uh, Stephen would be stoned. And in the middle, Christ would be crucified. Just as it was perfectly timed. Just as you can trust those prophecies. You can trust that Jesus is about to return. And who shall be able to stand? Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word and these prophecies. I pray in a special way, Lord, that you prepare our hearts for what is to come upon the earth. And Lord, now is the time for us to get ready that we would be able to stand. Lord, in the next message when we study more about those who can stand, I pray, Lord, that we would begin now to gravitate to your word, your word and toward your truth so that we would be able to stand. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.